this course is uh, on kinematics and dynamics of machines. So, as you would imagine, this is all about machines. So, we would try to go behind what you see as a machine and try to understand how machines work because machines is what distinguishes mechanical engineering from everything else, other branches of engineering. I would give you some examples and then go into the details of the course. This is in slot 5, so we would be meeting today, Wednesday 9.30 to 11 and Fridays 9.30 to 11. My name is Seishu, I have joined as a faculty member here in 89 stayed on till around 2010. 2010 I went to head one of the CSIR labs, it is a government of India labs, about 40 of them, 35, 40 of them all over the country. So, I went to head one such lab in Bangalore, came back in 14, 15 and 16 I was here, 17 when government decided to set up this new IIT in Karnataka. So, I went as its founder director, came back literally about two months back and in October I returned to IIT Bombay. So, that is briefly about myself as a professor of mechanical engineering. My email is written there. So, any of you need to reach out to me, anything related to this course or otherwise, please feel free to drop me an email like this. My office is on the second floor of mechanical engineering department, room number is S39, you can drop by there, most of the day I would be available there. If I am not there, you can leave a message for me. Let us look at some example mechanisms to figure out what are we going to learn in this course. So, this is first example of a mechanism which is one of the oldest mechanisms in the conventional sense of making something bigger or smaller. You can adjust, you have seen here as uh, originally is a small letter A and it becomes larger or you can adjust it such a way that it can become smaller if the original is bigger. So, it is a essentially a copying mechanism. Now, in this course as we go along we will try to figure out answers to some interesting questions like, how does somebody come up with such a mechanism? You can understand the need that I want to enlarge or shrink a given object, but how do you think of a mechanism that does this purpose? Okay. That is what we would call as the problem of synthesis. However interesting that may be. I would only be able to briefly allude to that in this course because it is packed into one semester course. I do not even think that it is in the syllabus, but it is a very interesting question to me as we go through a large number of examples. How did somebody who is just like you and me, right? How did he think of something like this? So, we would try to explore that question. Another question that we would like to explore is that. Okay, somebody who I assume is probably brighter than me figured this out. He came up with this kind of a machine mechanism which does this job. How do I figure out whether it really works or it does not work? Does it work well? Given the mechanism, can I figure out its position, velocities, accelerations, forces transmitted and so on, that it is able to do its job well or not. If not, can I do a little better than that improvement? If it is doing its job well, is there a scope for optimization so that I can reduce the cost and so on and so forth. Okay. So, we would call this group of questions as analysis. So, broadly there are two groups of questions that we would be addressing in this course. One is synthesis, another is analysis. It is easier question obviously to look at analysis because the mechanism is given to you. 
you know the purpose which it is intended to serve. Analysis questions are relatively easier. Within that, we would talk about some subclassifications as we go along. It's relatively easier questions, but to be able to come up with a mechanism in the process of synthesis is slightly more interesting for those of you who are more creatively minded. How do you think of a machine which does this job? Then it can always be designed. Okay, So keep this perspective in mind. So this mechanism, I am just showing some very simple mechanisms to begin with so that you understand what this course is all about. I am interested to draw nearly straight line. What would be a mechanism that does that? What is a machine that can draw a near straight line? If you possible, I would like to have an exact straight line. If it is not possible, I can do with something like a near straight line. Okay. So this is a mechanism. So as this rotates with probably an electric motor here, then this point traces a path from on this line which is almost a straight line. Of course, towards the ends, this is no longer a straight line. So we there is a region wherein it can trace a near perfect straight line. So the same kind of questions that I talked about with respect to the previous example hold good even here. How did somebody think of something like this? Okay, and so on and so forth. This is a quite old mechanism called a slider crank mechanism. We would don't worry about the names. It does the job of uh, you know converting a rotary motion into a sliding motion. The objective here is that somebody wants to cut a wooden piece suppose. A wooden log is given, a tree has fallen, a branch is there, you want to just cut it. So you need the tool to move along a straight line. So somebody has thought of this mechanism, it is one of the probably the first, I don't know, that is what this claims, but I don't know, I can't verify that. This is the first slider crank mechanism ever thought of in the history of humankind. That is what this fellow claims, I don't know that. This is a machine I am sure all of you have worked on or seen or something like that. You want to surface of a work piece, you want to shape it. Okay, it is called a shaper. So here is going to be the work piece. And the tool will be here and you would be doing the shaping operation here. Our objective in this course would be to go beyond this frame which all of you would have seen before this course. Any layman would see it. The moment I talk in terms of a shaper machine, this is what you would see, right? But my interest is not stopping there. I want to rip it apart, go inside. Figure out what the hell is there inside. How does it work? How did somebody design this? Can it be optimized? Can the cost be reduced? Can the material be saved? And so on and so forth. All these questions cannot be answered in one course, but I want to spark these questions in your mind so that as you go along in your courses, other courses, you would be able to put the jigsaw puzzle of four years probably some 40 odd courses together where all these things fit in. Okay. Let us see a little bit behind this. I think my next slide has the mechanism of this. So if I repeat a part, it will look like this. You would not see it on the face of the machine, okay. but you would see when you open it apart and look at all the parts of the, so here you will see the, what is called the driving pinion. So there is a motor that drives this, rotates this, but remember if the motor is giving it a rotation, what you want the tool is to move along a straight line. And then somebody asked this question that if I am doing a cutting operation, say in this case the shaping operation. 
If I am moving the tool like this, supposing it is cutting, when I am coming back, I am not doing anything. I am not cutting. So, why I waste my time to come back? So, this is what is known as a quick return motion mechanism. So, I would go slowly at the speed that you set as an operator of the machine to cut this particular work piece. I go at that pace in the forward stroke, but return I want to come back fast because I am not doing any useful work. So, the requirement is understood, but again interesting to think of how this mechanism was conceived in the first place, how does it work? What would be the position, velocity, acceleration, forces, etc., etc., for that cutting tool with respect to time? How I can design something like this, how I can analyze, how I can improve upon this design, and so on and so forth. So, this is what you would call as the kinematic sketch. After this course, you should be able to actually think in terms of any machine that you see in its bare bones as a kinematic sketch, not that box, outer box in green color or red color or whatever, whatever, okay. That is our aim. And then you should be able to analyze, then you should be able to simulate it in the computer, then you should be able to optimize it, then you should be able to actually design it and of course, prototype, manufacture, sell, okay, fair enough. This is a typical sewing machine, right? You must all have seen. Is there anyone who has not seen a sewing machine? Maybe you may not have used it, but right? It's a very common sewing machine, simple sewing machine. Again, when you see it, you wouldn't notice, but when you repeat a part, you will see lot of complicated set of interconnected bodies driven by some prime mover. In this case, it could be a human pedal, you know, a person sitting on the stool pedaling it or it could be an electric motor or it could be a hydraulic actuator, it could be a pneumatic actuator, it does not matter what is the actuator. It could be just two bulls going round and round in an agricultural field. It does not matter what is the source of primary motion. Of course, for a design, we need to know its characteristics, force, time, force, velocity and all that. But given that, you see that all these interconnected tiny, 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 tiny parts, hundreds of them literally, seem to work so beautifully interconnected, coordinated motion. You would not get any weird motion ever. How is that achieved? This would be the equivalent kinematic sketch just to understand the motion and force transmission from the input to the output, which is the aim of this course. We want to understand because in most engineering applications, I was just walking down and uh, you know a car went by me. I was thinking, you must have realized that where the power is generated in the IC engine in the car is somewhere, but where you need motion is actually at the wheels, so that the tire touches the ground and then the car can move forward. So, in most engineering applications, the fundamental problem we find is that energy power is generated somewhere, it is required somewhere else. You need to be able to transmit motion and power to where it is needed in a manner that does not cause too much losses, so that your efficiency is high. So, here is another example of, uh, I will just skip through these you know uh, slides, so that you get an idea of the applications of this course, but you would see any number of them online, I mean I, there is no limit, I, I just had to you know, sit down and think of a few of various applications and then I put a few slides, but you can literally get hundreds and hundreds of such applications all over. This is of course, a site familiar to most of you, 
you would see now in any manufacturing plant that you use industrial robots for manufacturing. What you see here is that this is like a pick and place kind of a robot. It is able to pick up a few objects, maybe completed, maybe partially done, awaiting their next operation in the manufacturing cycle. The purpose of this robot is to pick them and place them somewhere else where the next operation is to be done. If it is a finished product, it could be packaging next step or stamping the product number and so on. If it is a product still in transit, then it is the next stage of machining, finishing, whatever. The job of this robot is to pick it up and place it somewhere. So think of it as my hand as a two hour manipulator robot. Okay, two revolute joints, we will talk about these things later on. So one revolute joint here, it can rotate and another is this, simple I am saying, I am not talking about all these other motions that we can do. So look at it as a simple industrial robot. Now if you want higher and higher speeds of manufacturing, so that you can build more cars, more products for consumers, then the robot should be able to do it fast, which would mean dynamically, all of you have done courses in physics. So this entire course is actually going to be application of basic mechanics in physics. So you have all done that, right? Classical mechanics, that too, nothing great shakes there. Simple classical mechanics. So we would all be looking at only kinematics, means particle motion, that you have studied. I would try to review it, but those of you who have uh, kind of forgotten, please review the same. Okay, I would try to briefly touch upon that as we go along. So, uh, from the dynamics point of view, as speeds increase, so you can imagine that there would be higher and higher forces. How are you going to take care of this? Now, if this part, we do not know what this part is. By the way, all of these Slides have a reference here in case you need to check more, you can go and <laughs> take a look. If this is, I, I have an example of that also. Supposing this were a laddu being made in Tirupati temple, okay. I, I do not know what this product is, okay. Just imagine that this is a laddu being made in Tirupati temple. <laughs> How many laddus do you think are made in Tirupati temple a day? Anybody from Tirupati or nearby? Now you are hesitant to show up. Just check and see. So if you want to design a robot which can make, I, I would show you a machine that does it by the way. In fact, a little more complicated than that is Rasgulla's machine, I will show. So how do you design a machine that can handle Rasgullas, a robot which can handle Rasgullas. Obviously, you can imagine that you need to have feedback of the force with which the arm and the fingers of the robot are touching, gripping the Rasgulla. You need to have a feedback of that, otherwise you would crush it, crumple it. Correct? So, you would see that this course connects with the different, different courses and then makes it as a whole from design point of view. Based on this course alone, you obviously cannot design because you thought a force feedback and corresponding controls laws. You cannot design a machine robot which designs Rasgullas making machine. You can't do that without force feedback and corresponding control strategies. So we will see how this course interfaces with control systems. This is another robot, okay, typical, you can imagine a, a warehouse of Amazon or Flipkart or anything like that, you know, hazard products, lots of shelves and this and that, etc. You just have to program it, you have XYZ coordinates that this is where this thing is stored, it is programmed into that robot. It goes around, picks it up and brings it to you, okay. 
So, this is now you would see these two examples compared to the earlier examples that I talked about are involving spatial motion x, y, z coordinates. It is not just confined to two planes, it is not planar. We would think in terms of the mechanisms that are used there and then this is a machine that does offset printing. I am sure you have gone through printing a uh, you know, large number of brochures for recent TechFest and Mood Indigo and so on and so forth. So, offset printing process, right? It is a very complex machine that does this. Every day newspaper, for example, in the morning comes through this, okay? And a large number of magazines and this and that, everything is nowadays through this offset printing process. How do you do? a multicolor offset printing. What is a machine? How did, how did somebody design the mechanism that does this? That is of interest to us. We would like to analyze if possible, really speaking not possible in this course, but I want to trigger you into those lines. Of course, you are familiar with this, right? So, you can imagine yourself, I am not young enough for that, but probably some of you could be right here. Who knows? Right? Elon Musk willing one and you being able to pay for it, perhaps you would be there. So, how do you design a mechanism? Okay, you can see some complicated mechanism like this. Okay, starting from here all the way, lots of links and lots of parts connected together with various motors, actuators and sensors, control systems, electronics, mechanical systems together doing the job in an international space station. Obviously, it is not like this when this fellow took off from ground, correct? It is not jetted out like this when it took off from the ground. So, you are now talking in terms of what are called deployable mechanisms. I should be able to close myself in, collapse into a compact volume when needed from the point of view of packaging volume at the time of launch. But then when I am in the orbit, when I need to, I should be able to jet out. Okay, so, these are called deployable mechanisms. In space applications, these are very much essential because you want to reduce the volume of packing and then unfurl it when needed. This is a textile loom, practically everything that we are wearing okay, comes from this, either hand looms or <coughs> mechanized looms. Okay. So, you can, if anybody is interested, you can observe it, study it closely and so on, you would see that it has a very intricate patterns woven into the design. You look at uh, a silk sari being made from or a handloom woven sari being made from Banaras to Calcutta to Tamil Nadu to anywhere, Andhra Pradesh and so on and so forth. Many of these artisans do it, okay. Those are hand looms and these are mechanized things. Even those machines have large number of very interesting high speed mechanisms. Sometimes it used to happen when I was back here in Bombay, but now also it may be happening uh, a textile machinery exhibition that happens in Bombay. So, if something like that happens, I would let you know and uh, if you figure out you can let the class know you should attend that. You would see machines from Switzerland, Germany and all over the world, massive machines which do these various textile operations. They have spindles running inside them at hundreds of thousands of RPM. There is no ceiling fan here, otherwise I would have asked what is the typical speed of your ceiling fan, you know? Does somebody know? What is the speed of a ceiling fan? 
speed of rotation. So when I and you can hear it right when when you switch it on when it is running exhaust fans, okay. household mixes. When you are at home, when your mother starts off the mixy at preparing for breakfast, you still want to sleep a little longer. You can hear it, right? These machines have spindles running inside them at hundreds of thousands of RPM. You can't feel it. You are standing next to it. You can't feel that there is something inside that is running at 100,000 RPM. How do they achieve? You just have to look at your own washing machines in the hostels. Has anybody used the washing machines in your hostels? They are top loaded or front loaded? Top loaded. Have you stayed there long enough to see how it operates? Next time maybe you would like to do that. And how it shakes? How it shakes as because the loads that you put are your clothes. They are not axisymmetric about the vertical axis of the top loaded washing machine. I will discuss this probably in the second half of the course as an example. They are not symmetric about that axis of rotation. So it is not really balanced. Poor thing it shakes all directions because you understand that a mass rotating off center exerts a force. And so it just keeps being pulled apart in different different directions and the whole thing shakes. But here you have some of these machines wonderfully designed, wonderfully precision manufactured that does not shake. You cannot feel it standing there next to it. How did somebody achieve that? How can you analyze, simulate in the computer at least so that you can see how much vibration is being caused and so on. Lots of agricultural applications now, there are large number of startups coming in this field, agricultural uh, sector. You would notice that when the government wants to double the farmer's income and so on, the objective is to improve the productivity of the uh, agricultural produce in the country. It's among the lower uh, segment compared to other countries in the world. Of course, our land holding per farmer on an average, on an average, our land holding per farmer is about one acre, two acres. You have an idea what is one acre, two acres? How big is that? Huh? How big is one acre, two acres? What is comparable in size to what you have seen in the campus? What is the size of our campus? Very good. So, you can imagine a farmer having one acre, two acres. What kind of mechanization can he or she do? Automation, process control, so that he or she can get maximum output given all the variations that are possible in an agricultural sector starting from climate. How you can use machines to improve her productivity. That's your job, my job as engineers to help them achieve that. So, I have shown here just two examples of typical agricultural machinery. I can't do a course for mechanical engineering students without talking about automotives, right? So, this is an example of a mechanism that is used in automobiles. All of you know it, right? What is the requirement here is that when the vehicle is taking a turn, okay, you can see from basic physics that when the vehicle is taking a turn, the inner wheels go through less r theta compared to the outer wheels. Obviously, in the same time, I mean when the vehicle takes a turn, both the wheels have to be traversing that at the same time. 
So the inner wheels have to traverse less distance in a given time compared to the outer wheels. That means you need to be able to get two speeds, different speeds. One is faster than the other only when it is taking a turn. Only when vehicle is taking a turn, not when it is going straight, then you have trouble. Not when it is going straight, but only when it is taking a turn. So, how do you design a mechanism that gives you two different outputs with single input from the engine you are getting only one speed. When needed you should get two different outputs when needed not otherwise. So, automobile differential set of gears does this beautiful mechanism very compact. So, in case someone has not seen it please check that. Okay, let us see next automobile example. Okay, in all these examples that I have talked about, there is continuous motion. Just as I have been going up and down, up and down, I cannot stand in one place and talk. Okay, continuous motion as the input prime mover, motor, whatever it is, rotates, all the other parts are rotating. But this fellow in an automobile application is a very interesting application demand that the input can continue to rotate, but Baba I have to maintain my position for some time. I do not want to move, I cannot move. Even though the rest of the mechanism is moving, rest of all the bodies are moving, I cannot move. It is a very peculiar application, very peculiar demand. Why would you need this? If you look at how an IC engine works, I am sure you have all uh, seen or heard about IC engines, internal combustion engines and so on and so forth. So, take the simpler case of a four stroke engine because the simpler I say because each stroke is designated for one purpose only. So, you have a cylinder, you have a piston going up and down. You take in fuels, air, first stroke is when you take it in, so the piston moves down, second stroke is when you compress it, so piston moves it up, so you are compressing what you have taken in and then ignition happens and then because of the power generated the piston moves down. and products of that combustion, the gases have to be checked out. So, you push the piston up again, so that the exhaust goes out. Now, in these four operations that I mentioned, the taking in, compression, then power stroke and then exhaust. There are two strokes which are of interest to us at this point, not interest to courses on IC engines or something like that that you might have done. First, when you want to take it in, let it be air or air fuel mixture, whatever, okay, air or air fuel mixture depending upon the type of engine. When you want to take it something in, then the inlet valve, this fellow has to be open, say supposing it comes down a little and stays there so that it can flow around that, okay. it can flow around that, it has to stay open for some time, so that all the air or air fuel mixture can come inside. It should not move, it cannot close, it cannot change its position, it has to maintain a position just like that, steady. Then the moment intake is over, it should just shut up. Okay, and stay there. Now, when the combustion is over, when I need to exhaust the combustion gases, then this exhaust wall should come down a little, stay open so that all the exhaust gases can go out. It cannot move 
during that time. It should just stay open. And then when exhaust is over, because the next cycle of inlet happens, so this fellow should move up and shut and stay shut. Otherwise, whatever is being taken in will go out. So this is an interesting application wherein while the rest of the machine moves, rest of the parts of the machine move, some parts have to stay put where they were. And how do you capture it in IC engines course? You must have seen this kind of a valve timing diagram. Okay. So, in intake valve opening suction happens and then intake valve closes. So, this much time the intake valve should be open and then here exhaust valve opens and exhaust valve closes before the next cycle happens. So, we have an interesting mechanism which does this job. Let me see if I can show you that. This is that. This is what is known as a cam follower system. What the cam does, so this is what it is. Here you see the wall. This is a connecting linkage, you forget that for now. This end of this linkage rides on what is called a cam. As this camshaft rotates, this cam also rotates and the follower sitting riding on that follows the profile of the cam. You design the profile of the cam, in this class you will do it. You will design the profile of the cam to determine how long the wall will stay open or shut. Now comes the trickier part. This is the kinematics part, kind you know, movements part. But then ask yourself, how often does it happen? In a cycle, let us say once for the wall. How many cycles in a second or a minute? What is the speed of an IC engine? Okay. Guess and that's a bolo to you would just tell some range of speed, thousands of RPM. How many thousands? <coughs> Let us take say 3000, 6000, some number which is divisible by 60, right? It is so many revolutions per minute when he says RPM, correct? So, how many per second? So, supposing I take 6000 RPM, how many per second? Huh? 100 times. Just think of your hand as the valve, your hand as the valve which needs to shut and open, 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 100 times a second. How many times can you do it? In a second? How many times can you do it in a second? Why can't you do it more often? Huh? Now, this fellow has to do it 50 times, 100 times a second, day in and day out, every single time that you operate it without fail for its entire duration of life, entire duration of life. I have a car which is 20 plus years old. I finally donated it to IIT Dharwad to convert it into an electric vehicle. Still the camshaft has not given a problem, not the wall. 2000 I bought it, today is 2023, right? 2022 I donated it to IIT Dharwad before coming back here. I said I don't need it anymore now. 22 years. We have done something like 200,000 kilometers in that car. I have driven from here to Kanyakumari in that car multiple times. No problem whatsoever. How does a mechanical engineer like you manage some 
magic like this. It's just sheer magic whenever I think of it. How often have you gone to the hospital? You have been here for three years, right? At least three years you have been here. Uh, I mean, of course, in between you weren't in the campus. But for the period that you have been in the campus, how often have you gone to the camp hospital? This fellow, this camshaft follower, wall, shutting and closing 50 times a second, 100 times a second, has never gone to the mechanic even once in its 22 years of operation. We want to understand in this course how engineers manage this sheer magic. How does it function like that? Okay. We will see how to do it as we go along. But this comes before the mid semester, maybe sometime next month or something like that. It's not that camps are used only in IC engines. It's don't get me wrong there. I just used that as an important example application. Camps are used in many, many applications all over the uh, industry. Before, in fact, all this uh, revolution of uh, sensors driven control systems, electronic microprocessor based controls came. It was all cam operated mechanization. Entire manufacturing industry mechanization was based on cams. Okay. We would not have time to dwell into those parts, but you would see that cams are used in a large number of applications. Okay. I have just shown here one such application and I have given you a reference of a recent paper, recent about five years back, okay, to say that these are topics that people all over the world, it is a mechanism and machine theory is one of the leading journals in this field, has published an article by a researcher on this particular topic. So, these are topics that people are still grappling with, understanding the dynamics. High speed operations, what happens in this? Okay, another. This is something that you must have noticed. Has anybody not seen something like this? What is this? You switch it on and off, right? When there is a problem. When there is a problem in your house, in your room, you can switch it on and off. What does it do? It makes or breaks an electric contact. All That is all that it does. Makes or breaks an electric contact. If you see this, you cannot imagine. If when you see the at front side, you see this and you would have operated this switching on and off, but you would not realize that behind this fellow, there is a complex mechanism like this. There are contacts here, you would see here static contact and moving contact. So, this is a stationary contact and then this is a moving contact and the rest of this whole thing is to make it move in a particular manner. We had a massive project with uh, LNT and Crompton pitching in 25 percent of the money and talking about late late 90s because they, they have got these circuit breakers mechanisms designs from some companies and they were making it and selling. But the mechanism is so complex that they needed our help to analyze, understand and improve upon the design. The two contacts have to make contact, one is stationary of course, the other fellow is moving and coming in contact. Imagine sometimes you read in the newspapers that the whole western grid has come off, power shut down for a brief while. So, it has a, the power grids have a sensor that there is some trouble somewhere and then immediately it will trigger that the contact should break 
automatically. And then when the power, when this is repaired, rectified, it should close contact again, we should all get power again, right? This closing and opening should happen in typically milliseconds, milliseconds. And when you close contact, when you close contact, it should not come and hit this and then you know go back and forth and slowly settle down. You can't afford that because of the extremely high short circuits that would develop. When you close in milliseconds, it should just smoothly come and close. It just cannot have any rebound. You have to design this entire mechanism. You will see a lot of complex mechanisms here, okay, which will conspire, so to say, to close this contact so smoothly in the time of a few milliseconds. And how do you even see that, visualize that? So, you need high speed videography to even figure this out how this fellow is closing. The cameras that we used at that time had only about 1000 frames per second. Now you would have much more of course, but you are able to visualize, you can put markers and visualize the motions of these links and figure out how to design this type of mechanisms. Okay. So another example of automobiles, because all of you are excited about it, this could be a model of a car or uh, anything, I mean here I have shown it as a car, it could be a bus, okay, I don't know what you used to come to the campus after the winter holidays. So has anybody come by bus, overnight bus, was it comfortable? No, right, you are a mechanical engineer or a metallurgical engineer? Mechanical, no? so you should wonder what the hell is this? Why is it not comfortable to travel by night bus? Right? So, we address this question in this class. We would look at these models of vehicles. Okay, You can have a multi-body dynamic model of a vehicle, whether it is a bus or a passenger car or whatever. And naturally, you would ask the follow-up question, why is say, Maruti Alto 800 priced X amount, whereas say a BMW X1 is priced so much. Why? Why is that more comfortable to travel in a Mercedes Benz? Of course, you shouldn't ask Rishabh Pant, but why is it more comfortable to travel there? compared to what my friend did overnight bus journey. What is wrong in the design where we have not understood what needs to be done or we understand and we compromise. So we ask this question in this class, in the second half when I talk in terms of forces and accelerations and so on and so forth. One application example I take will be the what is called the ride comfort of a passenger. Of course, for you it is only one night. So, of course, there is another question, interesting question associated with the same slide that often people do not ask that I would like to trigger in your minds today and it bugged me when our government started this golden quadrilateral project. You know about golden quadrilateral project, right? What is it about? Multi right? Multi-lane highways being built in the country, okay? Why was I concerned about that as a mechanical engineer? So if you see, how much does it cost to build a road nowadays? Any guess? Let us quantify it, one kilometer lane uh, road, the road can have multiple lanes, but one lane let us say, 
just one lane, just one lane, one kilometer long. How much do you think it costs? Huh? Pardon? Uh, what's your name? Arpit says 30 lakhs. Okay, let's bid. He will, anybody else, any other guesses? Any other guesses? Huh? Yes? 2 crores, what's your name? Tribhuvan, Tribhuvan says 2 crores. Anybody for 2 crores? Anybody for 30 lakhs? Second chance, third chance, anybody in between? So it does cost now, you can google it, you can google it, it would cost you now about 5 to 6 crores to build 1 kilometer, 1 lane. It used to be about 2 crores some time back, it has increased now to 4 to 5 crores, okay. Arpit would if he quotes for 30 lakhs, he will get all the contracts. But the question that troubled me was that why does the road get damaged? If the government is spending so much money, why does the road get damaged? It's because of the trucks that go on these roads, goods transport vehicles. What percentage of goods do you think are transported by trucks in this country? You have railway goods trains, right? Okay. You have ships, you have airplanes cargo and you have these goods vehicles. What percentage of goods transport happens by road? Huh? 30 to 40 percent. What's your name? Asta says 30 to 40 percent. Any other guesses? 60, 70 percent. What's your name? Aditya. What's your name? Aditya and Bhavana feel 60 to 70 percent. Okay. So, they are close. About 60, 70 percent of goods transport in this country takes by road. Okay. And when goods vehicles go on these rough roads, because of the force between the vehicle and the ground road, the road gets damaged. And what does it depend upon? That force that causes the damage. In fact, it is found that it depends upon the fluctuations in that force, not the dead weight, but the fluctuations to the power of 4. To the power of 4, all of you are very smart kids, to the power of 4. So, if for some reason I can reduce by better design the fluctuations by half, the Possibility of damage to the road reduces by 16 times to the power of 4. Now, who causes this fluctuations? It turns out to be the suspension, the suspension in the vehicle. Okay. So, we I had a couple of PhD students look at this problem. How do you design? Suspensions are usually designed to improve my Tribhuvan's comfort when he travels by bus overnight. Correct? Not really bothered about the road. Fairly so, I mean, right? But when I am investing so much money, so we now have an additional objective in the optimization process of the suspension design that I want to optimize the ride comfort 
but not only that also the road damage so i had couple of phd students look at this problem we would probably try to explore that if time permits food processing industry i promise you that i will i can't serve you rasgullas but i can at least show you the machine that serves rasgullas how does it do that okay rasgullas of all the things i mean so such a tricky material to handle right so this machine makes rasgullas so next time when you visit tirupati shirdi whatever place i mean right Te temple you can just look at their kitchen or your own kitchens for that matter i don't know how often rasgullas are made in your kitchen so i cannot comment it's been almost 40 years since i have eaten in the hostel mess so i don't know but these places daily make laddus and such things so you can imagine how their kitchens operate what are the machines and so on so i can go on and on let me see if i have any more such example so that's it in terms of examples so basically you would get an idea that this course is all about the world in motion and i'll keep moving up and down this stage every wednesday friday morning this course is about the world in motion from agricultural machines to aerospace and so on and so forth industries to food processing in temples to every type of application that you can think of anything that moves is of interest to us in this course and that is what distinguishes mechanical engineering from other disciplines and therefore it is the core course for mechanical engineering students also for metallurgical students i have asked your professor vishwanathan head of the department right to give me some examples of applications in metallurgical engineering that i can use in the class so that you can get excited about those applications the question is what makes them move how did somebody i mean i deliberately avoided that question but that's really at close to my heart how can somebody think of a mechanism like that loosely specified in english the requirement but then you have to translate it into some deliverable objective and then design a machine to de deliver that objective how does somebody come up with that then given that how they move how the motion and force are transmitted how can we improve and optimize the design of course lot of other issues related to that how do you package it how do you as i said i mean my old car for 22 years i didn't have to touch my camshaft follower linkage how do you improve upon the reliability their operations and so on and so forth so the main point i want you to appreciate as students of this course is share poetry in motion geometry and forces how they actually work together how they are resulting in long life for the machines that's our job in this course to deliver so it's not possible obviously to answer all these questions that i mentioned in one course so you have a large number of courses actually some you have already done some you are going to do and so on and so forth in broadly what is called design engineering you have done courses on structural analysis and design correct mechanical engineering students have done uh, when i say you it's primarily intended for mechanical engineering students solid mechanics strength of materials and so on and so forth so given a structure you guys are now able to find out from the forces what are the stresses can it withstand the forces will it fail and so on and so forth so that part is taught to you in solid mechanics strength of materials then you had a course on materials i am sure metallurgical engineering students have done many courses on materials and their behavior and so on when we were students as engineers mechanical engineers and all that we never talked about glass never ever uttered the word glass in any of my courses 
today if i take look at my mobile phone my mobile phone screen anything is involving glass it has become a common material i have to now understand okay how different materials work how i can design my machine with suitable materials composite materials not just metals the course that you mechanical engineering students used to have i don't know now how it is engineering metallurgy or whatever used to be essential about metals okay they ruled the world i agree but now they have to make place for other materials composites glass and ceramics and so on and so forth okay so that was taught to you in that course in this course we would look at mechanisms part this course but you have another course which tells you how to control that mechanism machine okay you have already done or you are going to do this micro course done no mechanical students you have done okay so controls pata hai so you know how to select a material you know how to design the structural part of the machine you know how to control that you know how to do the thermal management i am sure you must have done dozen courses thermodynamics heat transfer fluid mechanics this that etc et right so you know how you can regulate the heat in your machine so that it stays cool and operates for long life thermal courses some of you would probably take up an elective course on design optimization okay how can you optimize a design okay so that is another course some of these aspects are taught or not taught manufacturing you have done 1 2 3 4 whatever number of courses and labs and so on and so forth so you know what is the manufacturing process that results in the kind of finish that you want at a price point that you can sell right so you have done this and of course it affects the design then design for maintenance nowadays user interface design is also very very important right how the users use your machine and design and all these are not taught to the best of my knowledge in the courses here if you are able to look at other department courses like idc might offer courses on uh, user interface design so you may be able to take electives on that so there is a large number of such courses i want you to fit in your mind a large variety of courses that you would undergo during these four years how they fit into that jigsaw puzzle of mechanical engineering so that overall you get a hang of this integration is something that has to happen in your mind each course the professor comes and teaches but 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 whatever is the syllabus of that course but the integration of all the courses ultimately the job of mechanical engineers or any engineer for that matter is to be able to design innovative products and sell them in a market that is extremely competitive right that helps you I mean the all these courses help you to achieve that objective now what is this particular course about therefore i say topics to be discussed because as you would have noticed two things that you would have noticed in this course one i am uh, asking you a lot of questions keep waiting for your response from you so we we would say that these are the topics to be discussed in the class not that i would just go on telling you what needs to be known that you can get it from your book okay another thing that you might have noticed is that i asked you for a lot of numbers <laughs> as engineers if you are not comfortable with numbers you don't have a feel for what is one acre two acres or what is the cost for this particular thing you are not really an engineer okay so you got to become familiar with numbers okay so that's another thing you would have noticed that i would keep doing it as we go along i want you to be comfortable with have an idea of how it system works in the world so we would what we would do is to review basic kinematics and kinetics i think it is insulting to you if i 
spend too much time on this. If I am mistaken, you please correct me. But I would get bored if I were sitting in the class, somebody comes and reviews kinematics and kinetics and all that, all done and dusted, preparing for JE, then first year physics classes and engineering mechanics and so on and so forth. But just in case some of you need it, I will spend a little while to review that. But any of the standard textbooks, engineering mechanics, physics, I do not think I can do any justice better than that. So, you can, if you are not comfortable, please read those parts once again. But our, what we have just now looked at is this introduction to various mechanisms, applications in various machinery. So, I hope I have succeeded in conveying to you how important this course is from an application point of view. We would be looking at the kinematics and dynamics of these machines, in particular position, velocity, acceleration, force and so on and so forth. I, I forgot force, sorry, I should add that. I mentioned that we would look at specific mechanisms that talk about how do you maintain a position for some duration of motion, those are cam followers. I would talk about an application requirement where motion needs to be transmitted at a fixed velocity. If I am rotating at 1000 rpm, I want the output to run at 200 rpm, 1 is to 5 ratio, that is it. How do I get this kind of fixed ratios? So, that is through gearing. So, we would look at how gears are designed. Then we will come to this is all is kinematics, it actually the list listing does not do justice to the amount of time we would be spending. To my mind, we would complete this point by mid semester. But to be honest, I have not taught this course in this form ever. When I was teaching it, when I was back in IIT Bombay earlier, I it used to be a two semester course. So, I used to teach it as a two semester course. Now, it is combined into one semester. So, I do not really know how we would do on the time front. So, we give our take, we would hope to do this by mid semester. And this part, though it appears to be only two lines compared to some three, four lines here, would keep us busy for the second half, post mid semester. That is my guess about how the time is distributed in this course. Books are references that you might want to see, they are arranged in alphabetical order here. You can pretty well see any book that you think is interesting to you. I do not come into the picture at all, but I have listed a few in the alphabetical order. I have particular preference for some books, but all are damn good. Uh, Ghosh and Malik, they were professors in IIT Kanpur, Mechanical Engineering Department, uh, they retired. They have written excellent series of books on uh, kinematics, dynamics, mechanisms, manufacturing science and so on and so forth. So, it is a very nice book to read, but not uh, easy I would say. You have to be seriously reading that book. Miriam and Craig is mainly to review your engineering mechanics in case you have doubts, uh, kinematics, dynamics, forces, particles, free body diagrams, whatever, whatever you have done. In case you have doubts, you can refer to that. But you can refer any engineering mechanics book, it does not matter really. Hibbler is fine. I do not particularly like shames, but if you think it is good, you can use it. Norton is a very nice book on design of machinery. The title is interesting, design of machinery. He does not talk it as theory of machines or kinematics and dynamics of machines, but he gives it a title design of machinery, because ultimately what we need to do is its design, okay, very nice book. Burton Paul is a very nice book, old book. Uh, I have enjoyed reading it as a student about 40 plus years back, 45 years ago or something like that, 40 years back, but you can refer to that, it is very nice book. Uh, S.S. Ratan is an in Indian edition book, Tata McGraw-Hill book, it is very nice, lot of examples worked out and so on and so forth. 
very good no no problem at all uh, thomas bevan again uh, i have enjoyed reading it as a student uh, when i was exposed to this subject bevan you can read it even now it is a pleasure to read thomas bevan but for you it's each student is different so i am giving you a list of books so you can pick and choose uh, thomas bevan has a habit of uh, describing in words how the machines work or how the design is done and so on before getting into the uh, details so it's up to you but what each student likes you can choose what you want this is mainly for uh, second half say more saint hinkel second half of the course vibrations especially uh, shigley is i think he was a professor in uh, if i remember correctly michigan ann arbor uh, he, his book then became others have written shigley and ilker and other spano joined classic textbook on theory of machines kinematics and dynamics of machines a classic textbook so we would probably be essentially doing cover to cover of this book if you look at the topics okay in some condensed form so you can pick and choose any book you want looking at the class strength i think this is the only feasible assessment mechanism though i don't like it so much when i began teaching here in 89 class strength used to be around 50 around 50 students in the class and i used to know each one of you by the by your first name now it is impossible i would spend most of my time assessing you the most boring part of teaching profession is having to assess somebody else i have absolutely no interest in assessing how much you know or how much you don't know but it is a statutory requirement as a job of a professor teaching a course so i have to do it personally i would prefer that we have lot of projects and make you do things so that you learn while doing and you get assessed but with nearly 150 200 students it is impossible to implement something like this so easier option is this let me see if i can revive my enthu and think of some projects and redistribute it during the semester we can do it but otherwise this will be the default option easiest on four occasions we just have tests and be done with it 